fighters, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Through the lens of today's modern 21st century life, one built on global commerce, international cooperation, and seamless communications, it's almost impossible to truly imagine what life was like during far more hostile, dangerous, and unpredictable times. If we describe today as a world in a general but always uneasy peace, one marked more by regional conflicts and religious terrorism than global catastrophe, then we have to in turn describe the first half of the 20th century as something far different, something unrecognizable in its simmering tensions and constant strife. Whether it was the Russian revolutions that brought about Bolshevism, or the Great War that nearly tore Europe apart, or the global economic devastation that brought untold suffering and precipitated the rise of unhinged extremism, Life 100 years ago, or even 75 years ago, was far different than it is today, for a multitude of reasons. In short, the first half of the 20th century was rough. In just about every way imaginable, World War II, which officially raged from September 1939 through September 1945, represents the inevitable culmination of all of those intermingling crises, of all of the political upheaval, monetary despair, industrial uncertainty. And there are a few moments through hindsight that we look back at as representative of the time, place, and tenor in question. The Nazi invasion of Poland, Pearl Harbor, Iwo Jima, the Battle of the Bulge. But then there's the Day of Days, perhaps the most famous encapsulation of a world at war, of good versus evil, of united forces finally saving mankind from totalitarianism. I'm of course referring to D-Day, June 6, 1944, one of the most important days in history, a day that altered the course of human events forever, halting the rise of the most dangerous, backwards, and dastardly political movement to ever plague the earth. In a way, D-Day was the first day for a new, liberated, and modern Europe, a Europe that finally found peace after trying and failing for so long. It's the day that finally allowed humanity to turn the corner, making the second portion of the century far more palatable than the first. But as the old saying goes, it's darkest before the dawn. While we look at Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany as World War II's unavoidable antagonist, they weren't the only so-called Axis power. The other significant player in Nazi Germany's orbit was Imperial Japan, who since the 30s had been expanding its colonial empire throughout the Pacific, and throughout East and Southeast Asia as well. Japan's primary quarrel was with the United States and the United States alone, who it feared would ultimately come down on it for its violent expansionist policies. In a bold move, Japan opted to preemptively hit the United States to send a message and buy themselves precious time. In early December of 1941, Japan unleashed a devastating surprise attack on the key U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and the U.S. thereafter found itself sucked up in an incredibly gruesome, bloody, and hard-fought theater that would end with the nuclear bombings of Japan in the summer of 1945. In other words, we were truly dealing with global strife. This is important because it adds much-needed context to D-Day itself, something that happened far away from Japan, something that didn't involve the Japanese, but something that deeply involved their mighty adversary. While Japan was dealing with the U.S., along with its Australian, British, and Canadian allies, as well as other friendly nations all over the Pacific, Nazi Germany and its fascist Italian friends were doing battle on the other side of the world with a largely different cast. Nazi expansion in mainland Europe brought Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich into direct conflict with the French, Dutch, Belgians, Polish, and many others, plus the aforementioned British and Canadians, and it most notably found itself in a life-or-death struggle with the powerful Soviet Union on its eastern front. While all of this was happening, while the Nazis laid claim to country after country, erected puppet governments, and subjugated the people of Europe, the United States was reluctantly engaged at best, and then distracted at worst. And that's vital to understand, because the U.S. was the linchpin to the inevitable attempt to take Europe back. Sooner or later, the U.S. would need to swing its attention to the Nazis, and there was no way the Nazis were just going to give up, just going to surrender. One way or another, the situation necessitated a costly and dangerous, head-on approach. America's advantages were significant in World War II. Buttressed by two vast oceans and sharing no borders with hostile actors, the United States mainland saw virtually none of the conflict, outside of Pearl Harbor and what was at the time the territory of Hawaii, the brief Japanese occupation of Alaska's Aleutian Islands, some crude Japanese balloon bombs in the Pacific Northwest, and some Nazi spies that washed up on the East Coast. 
American men were dying by the thousands in the Pacific Island hopping campaign that began in earnest in 1942. But the U.S. was also the only primary World War II combatant with a totally intact industrial base, very easily the most important advantage any single party to World War II commanded. All the U.S. needed was time and space, neither of which the Allies, the British, the French, the Soviets, and the like, had very much of. It's not that there was something special about the U.S. per se, it's just that the U.S. found itself largely unmolested compared to just about every other major global power because of a peculiar and fortuitous combination of geography, politics, and alliances. So for the war to conclude successfully, the U.S. needed to commit to Europe full stop, and not just in a cursory way, not just with economic help, the insertion of experts and commandos, and whatever else defined America's involvement up to this point. And so the U.S. began that slow and steady trek when, in the days following the Pearl Harbor bombing, it officially declared war on Nazi Germany in addition to its Japanese ally. Ironically, even though stretched remarkably thin and lacking the men, material, and planning necessary to succeed, it was the Americans that were most bullish to get involved in Europe from the get-go, a strange offer to voluntarily split American attention in two and force a two-front war on a country that probably couldn't withstand it at the time. Predating what would become D-Day were the dueling proposed operations of Sledgehammer and Roundup, which mixed up various plans for taking Europe back from the Nazis as early as 1942, which in hindsight simply wasn't at all practical. And it was the British, not the Americans, who were pushing for constant delays to a hypothetical invasion. The so-called Atlantic Charter between the Allies identified Nazi Germany as their primary opponent, but with the Japanese sucking up so much of the oxygen with their efforts in the Pacific, and with the sheer daunting magnitude of fighting the Nazis in a final series of apocalyptic battles, the Allied countries agreed to bide their time, to carefully prepare and plan down to the most minor detail. They were especially spooked after the Dieppe raid during the summer of 1942, a blunderous temporary invasion of a Nazi-occupied port that proved disastrous for the British, Canadians, and Americans involved. Everyone knew a commitment to mainland Europe was necessary, but there was much bickering about how, when, and why everything should be done. And with the magnitude of men and material necessary to make this work, they realistically only had one shot, so they really had to make it count. And making it count meant putting it off for a bit, until absolute preparedness could be achieved. There was an important wrinkle, though, because it wasn't as if the Nazis were quietly waiting for this to happen. One Allied power in particular, the Soviet Union, was in dire need of help, and the constant change in Allied plans and the many vacillations of leadership weren't helping them. The Nazis threw away their peace treaty with the Soviets and invaded the country in 1941. And with the rest of Europe largely subjugated by this point, the communists were dealing with the entire might of the Nazi war machine by themselves. If the Soviets fell, a forced two-front war on the Nazis wouldn't happen, and everyone's fortunes could change, so time was actually still of the essence. War still raged on, even as the guns fell silent in Western and Central Europe, and the Soviets needed the pressure to be taken off, stat. Once the U.S. had the time to push the Japanese back towards their home islands a bit, and once they were able to ramp up production of the necessary and vital materials of war, they could officially commit to the European theater too. And so they did when British, French, and American soldiers invaded Mussolini, Sicily, and Italy in 1943, following a successful campaign in North Africa, wisely consolidating the Nazi threat to the European continent alone. But this wouldn't be nearly enough. The Allies would succeed in Italy, but would also be cut off from much of the continent by terrible terrain culminating with the towering Alps, and therefore a new, more effective front, one that could introduce hundreds of thousands of troops, tons and tons of material, and more to the occupied continent would be necessary. And so D-Day was finally born. The planning for D-Day was wrapped up in a top-secret series of plans and strategies known broadly as Operation Overlord, and Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower, who would not even a decade later become President of the United States, was in charge of everything. He was ably assisted by a litany of commanding officers from the U.S. and other allied countries, especially the U.K., which offered up their own heroic figures, timeless men like Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery and Admiral Bertram Ramsey. Operation Overlord and the ultimate conquering of the Nazi war machine would require four key elements, time, cooperation, planning, and practice. Without those four features intermingling perfectly, the allies would have a rough go at an already seemingly insurmountable problem. That's because the Nazis weren't stupid. They knew that a European invasion was absolutely positively inevitable. And so, in their own ways, they were ready. And they were even more ready when Hitler ordered what was known as Directive Number 51, which instructed his forces to build up even further occupied France's coastal defenses to a staggering degree. Meanwhile, the Allies also got to work. The original Operation Overlord plan was delivered to leadership in July of 1943, and it spanned a quaint 113 pages. But the brevity of that initial report belies what would end up becoming the single biggest lift in military history, an invasion unmatched in warfare both before June of 1944 and after. 
Millions upon millions of pages of strategy and planning were manufactured, along with literally millions of maps examining the most granular aspects of the coming conflict. And the scope of the invasion only got larger, too. Initially, a three-front beachhead in France was envisioned, but it expanded to five during the course of planning. These five beach names would thereafter enter the human lexicon and go down in history. Omaha, Utah, Gold, Sword, and Juno. Omaha and Utah would be left to the eager Americans, who have been fixing for a fight with the Nazis for several years. Gold, Sword, and Juno would be left to the UK, Canadians, French, and military men representing a dozen countries in total. One key to Overlord's success was tricking the Nazis into thinking that the obvious was in fact true. If you look at a map of the UK and France, you'll see that there's a point at the southeastern edge of the UK, near Dover, where the countries practically touch. The French city of Calais, which sits on a peninsula that juts out towards the UK homeland, was where the Nazis presumed the landing would take place, and the Allies were more than happy to let them think that. An entire operation parallel to Overlord, one called Operation Fortitude, was entirely dedicated to tricking the Nazis in a months-long series of feints. Radio transmissions were sent out to be intentionally misleading. Aerial reconnaissance was conducted to make it seem like that was the target. Even when D-Day was underway far off the coast of Normandy, much of the concurrent bombings actually took place towards Calais, in an attempt to indicate right up to the very end that that's where Allied landing forces would attempt to gain a foothold on the European continent. They went as far as to use dummy paratroopers to falsely bolster their numbers. The Allies even made it seem like decorated American general George Patton was leading this Mirage invasion, attempting to strike fear in the hearts of the Germans. In reality, the Normandy coast was the target, but even there, the Germans were readying themselves. In a popular mechanics article published mere weeks after the invasion in 1944, the Nazis' defenses in Normandy were described like this. Quote, The Nazi shore defenses consisted of a ring of tubular steel scaffolding built underwater 150 yards out from the high water line, and behind this a double apron of wire fence, concrete anti-tank barriers in zigzag arrangements with protruding steel prongs, and another double apron of wire fence. On the beach above the high water line was a three-foot barbed wire fence, a minefield, an intricate deep wire obstacle, an anti-tank ditch, concrete anti-tank wall, and concrete blocks to stop tanks. Behind this maze of beach defenses were pillboxes, further back heavy artillery. With the mined waters offshore, this composed the coastal sector of Hitler's West Wall, end quote. In other words, the Allies were about to have their hands full, regardless of where and when they landed. And the enemy, while unaware of their exact plans, was still lying in wait. During Operation Overlord's embryonic stages, May of 1944 was considered the unmovable date of an invasion that was already a couple of years in coming, and so all planning was arranged around that month. The sheer scope of the preparations in anticipation of May 1944 are hard to even describe. In fact, U.S. General George Marshall was once asked to talk about it, and he simply said that it all, quote, almost defies description, end quote. Imagine, if you will, the staging of millions of men, countless tons of supplies, planes, tanks, and other vehicles, fuel, food, clothing, boots, ammunition, and on and on and on. Now imagine doing that while trying to keep your exact plans a secret from the enemy, and while not being too disruptive to your host country. That the U.S. thought an invasion was feasible in 1942 or even 1943 seems so strange in hindsight. For every man that took to battle, three, four, and sometimes five men were behind him in a support role, whether they were cooking food or tending to the injured or repairing broken vehicles or translating intercepted messages or making maps or examining intel and so on and so forth. That D-Day was successful is a miracle in and of itself. That we ever even got to D-Day with the amount of planning and cooperation necessary to make it all go off without a hitch is perhaps even more miraculous. The only intangible that the Allies had working to their advantage was the transport of everything itself. The Nazis' once daunting U-boat warfare was all but nullified in the North Atlantic by this point. So at least that was one less thing to worry about. May of 1944 turned into an early June target when the Allies ran into a strange hitch. The specialized craft ordered by the thousands that would be necessary to land men, vehicles, and cargo onto the French beaches were taking longer to manufacture than anyone thought. So June 5th was the new target, but there was another snag, weather. So the ball was punted again for one final time and for only 24 hours. June 6 was the ultimate date, but even then, conditions were far from ideal. The madness actually began the night before, when American and British paratroopers were inserted into France in the dead of night to begin sabotaging Nazi infrastructure behind the beachfronts, as well as causing other chaos, so that by the time the beaches were taken, the two groups could unify into a substantial and permanent front on the European mainland. More than 23,000 paratroopers in total took off from the UK and landed on French soil not too long thereafter but those numbers would be dwarfed by the unthinkable scale of the beachside invasion of Normandy itself. As dawn broke, the game was on. 
A combined British and American naval force sat off of the French coast and bombarded Nazi pillboxes and other coastal defenses, while Allied bombers dropped tons of ordnance on the German front lines to soften everything up for the infantry. Thousands of aircraft, from escort fighters to bombers, took part in the D-Day invasion. In the eight hours before landing, 11,000 tons of bombs were dropped, while a stunning 2,000 tons of ordnance were fired from 600 guns aboard Allied naval vessels in only the 10 minutes before the first landing craft hit the sand. To keep the Nazis further befuddled, the Allies decided not to take full advantage of high tide, which is something they thought the Nazis would anticipate. So they landed craft in the hours before high tide, which made the run-up to the beaches more arduous and therefore the success of these bombings all the more essential. Interestingly, the Nazi Air Force, the Luftwaffe, had been so roughed up in the months and years before D-Day that they barely took to the air at all during the invasion. Nazi anti-aircraft batteries did a job on the Allied aerial forces, but interestingly, the skies above the beaches were largely left to the Allies, uncontested, meaning that the fight on the ground would be even more pivotal. The initial force of men numbered nearly 350,000. Almost 200,000 of them were manning the various naval vessels, from the bombarding battleships to the nearly 2,000 landing craft, and everything in between. Meanwhile, nearly 150,000 troops were the first to land across the five aforementioned beaches. Depending on which beach you're talking about, the level of violence varied. The American-taken Omaha Beach is known to be by far the most brutal and bloody of them all, which is why the U.S. military gets so much credit for D-Day. But in reality, this was an allied effort that crossed national lines, military branches, expertises, and egos. And ultimately, the landings were successful. By July 2nd, nearly a month after D-Day, over a million Allied troops, 560,000 tons of supplies, and 170,000 vehicles were introduced into Europe, and Nazi Germany's collapse was all but guaranteed thereafter. But it all came at a high cost. The invasion resulted in 10,000 casualties, and nearly half of those were fatalities, a shocking number for a conflict that saw demonstrable advances in medical care that ensured that one in four casualties actually returned to battle somewhat imminently a statistic unheard of in the decades and centuries prior. For context, the Allied men who lost their lives on June 6, 1944, outnumber significantly the number of American servicemen and women who have died in Iraq and Afghanistan combined in the last 17 years. D-Day's importance to human history and to sustained global peace cannot be understated. It represented ground zero of the inevitable collision between the Allies and the Axis powers that had been building in dribs and drabs for years. And as we already know, it was also the culmination of a half century's worth of political, economic, and societal buildup that was, in reality, a powder keg raring to blow. And so today, let's give thanks to those that planned the most daunting military expedition of all time, to those that fought tyranny and oppression, and most importantly, to those who laid down their lives for the cause. D-Day's role in where we find ourselves today can never be overstated. And that's why we still celebrate the boldness, heroism, and valor on display on June 6, 1944, and in the year that followed, as the Nazis' dream of world conquest was pulverized into dust after a 12-year reign that brought Europe, and the world, nothing but destruction, agony, and death. It's also a stark reminder of why maintaining global peace at all costs is nothing short of essential. After all, World War III would inevitably make World War II look like child's play.